Welcome, everyone. If you're able to keep your cameras on, we'd love to see you. If you can't, we also understand. Uh, welcome to Making Connections, a new monthly four-part series on loneliness, co-hosted by Allison Gilbert and Reimagine. My name is Andy Engel, and I lead virtual public programs at Reimagine. Since this series is all about making connections, please use the chat and tell us where you are and what drew you to this program. I'll tell you a bit about Reimagine. It's a nonprofit organization catalyzing a uniquely powerful community. People of different backgrounds, of different races, of faiths, uh, uh, people of no faith, all coming together to heal ourselves, our communities, and the world. We support each other in facing adversity, loss, and mortality, and to transform life's biggest challenges into meaningful action and growth. Reimagine resources, support groups, events like this one today are free and sliding scale for the public. This is made possible by the support and generosity of participants like you. So for those who already made a tax deductible donation when you registered for today's program, thank you. Your gift will immediately support Reimagine's mission to help people of all walks of life transform the hard parts into purpose and action. We host conversations about grief, loss, and struggle at Reimagine because so few spaces exist where we can talk about these things. And uh, we cast the net wide. We offer programs uh, on a sliding scale, and we present it in a format that is engaging. Allison Gilbert is an Emmy Award-winning journalist, author, and longtime Reimagine host of the series Past and Present. Our interests and passions always seem to be aligned with one another. And that continues to be true with this latest series that she birthed. Um, it's about the epidemic of social isolation and the ways we can build deeper connections with one another. And if you haven't read her article in the New York Times, please do it. Uh, my colleague, Nicole Tan, who's helping out on this program, will paste that in the chat. Uh, Allison profiled Dr. Ruth Westheimer the new loneliness ambassador for New York State. And uh, please have a look at that after the program if you haven't. Um, and also please register for the remaining programs in this four part series, it's through June. And generally it's on the third Thursday of the month. We've got a wonderful group of compelling and diverse guests in conversation with Allison. Um, one thing I wanted to note about tonight's program, we had, some challenges leading up to it. They were not um, uh, anticipated. Um, and there's some complexity involved here. But we had an amazing team that helped make this happen. And Allison will explain a bit more um, when I introduce her, which I'm going to do so soon. Um, but I want to first offer some Zoom tips. You can view a live transcription of this event by clicking on the CC button. And you can save that chat by clicking on the three dots in the chat box. And feel free to send me or Nicole a private note in the chat. If you have any technical issues, we can try to help you. OK. And now a few words about Allison. Allison Gilbert is a longtime Reimagine collaborator and host. She is the author and co-author of numerous books, including Listen World, How the Intrepid Elsie Robinson Became America's Most Read Woman, Past and Present, Keeping Memories of Loved Ones Alive, and Always Too Soon, Voices of Support for Those Who Have Lost Both Parents. You can follow Allison on Instagram, X, and Facebook. She's everywhere as A. Gilbert Ryder. Allison, we made it. And I'm so glad to be collaborating with you on this series. Um, and I loved serving as your producer uh, and also as your thought partner on this. 
So thank you for welcoming me in. And uh, I feel much more connected to you. Oh. So thank you. Take it away. Oh my gosh, I do too, Andy. Thank you so much. I am honored to be here today. I have wanted to do this program for a long time, this series. It really was born out of the conversation that I had with Dr. Ruth Westheimer when she was appointed New York's first ambassador to loneliness, really the first such role in the entire country. I feel like I've gotten so interested in this topic. And the more that I learn, the more that I know I'm in the just right space for me. What one lesson that has really taken me by surprise is that, of course, connections that are meaningful happen not by chance. Meaningful connections take work. And part of that work is vulnerability and being honest and transparent. So with that in mind, there are two things I wanna share. One is that I lost both of my parents fairly young and that made me feel really lonely. I felt that I was the only person in my young adult life who had been through that experience. And it's taken me years to move through that and find those people and those connections that have made me feel stronger and more whole. Secondly, and this is what Andy was referring to before, we are nothing but nimble here. <laughs> and I am so excited to introduce you today to Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstad, who I will in a moment. But at the 11th hour, we have had to make some significant but exciting changes to this program. Dr. Ruth and Dr. Morthy, the US Surgeon General, at the 11th hour had scheduling conflicts. However, this is the vulnerability piece. They allowed me to do what we needed to do before today. So I have incredible interviews to share with you. We have separated them into clips. I was invited to Dr. Ruth's apartment in New York City to conduct the interview, which was just such a treat. And Dr. Morthy, who has a lot of very important things to do, also sat down with me for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. All of that I'm going to be bringing to you today. So my first order of business is to bring on Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstadt, who I am so honored is with me today. Her credentials are long and I'm gonna summarize them in brief because I feel like we wanna to get to the heart of this conversation. Not only is Dr. Holt Lundstedt a psychologist, she is an expert in connections between social relationships, loneliness and physical and mental health. She runs, she is the director of the Social Connection and Health Lab at Brigham Young, and she is the founding scientific chair and board member, she knows what she's talking about, in other words, of the U.S. Foundation for Social Connection and the Global Initiative on Loneliness and Connection. Small potatoes. Not small potatoes, yes. And I will say one more accolade for Dr. Holt Lundstedt is that the U.S. Surgeon General put out an advisory calling loneliness an epidemic in this country last year. Guess who was the lead scientific editor on the Surgeon General's advisory, right, Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstedt. So please welcome her with me now. And I just wanna say hello and thank you. And I do wanna start right away, but just say hello. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. It's, it's so great to, 
to be here, even if it's, it's at, at a distance. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I want to start with something that just hit the New York times. Um, the world happiness report was just issued and it was released yesterday. And for the first time since the World Happiness Report was founded in 2012, for the first time, the United States is not ranked in the top 20 happiest countries in the world. So I want you to talk about that. But also, here's one more really important tidbit that I want to unpack with you today. The leading reason why our ranking decreased was because of people under 30 feeling incredibly isolated and disconnected. Were you surprised by this report? You know, um, in a way, it, like aspects of it were not surprising and aspects of it were surprising. And so uh, there, Year after year, we see the Nordic countries at the top of the list. And, and again, we saw that. And they've been doing this ongoing for a while. And so I think what was surprising about it was not only that there was such a drop for the United States, but how this was being driven primarily among the young. And what was interesting was when they broke it down uh, by age, if you look at those over, I think it was 60, uh, the U.S. was actually in the in the top 10. I think they ranked number 10. Uh, but when you look at uh, happiness among those under 30, it was ranked number 62. So not just, you know, not in the top 20, but I mean, it was really low. And so that is in some ways um, alarming, uh, but it's not entirely inconsistent with much of the data that we're seeing around how young people are struggling in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, we talk about loneliness, but also uh, just within the last year, there was also the release of the American Time Use Survey. And this is data on how Americans are using, you know, how they're spending their day <laughs> and, and how many minutes they're spending their day on, on each thing. And what was so interesting is that over the past two decades, we saw significant increases in isolation and significant decreases in time spent with lots of relationships. But one that I'll highlight is time spent with friends. And when you look at the age groups and break that down, again, you see this massive decline. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you saw a big different age difference with young people spending a lot more time with friends compared to older people. And over the past two decades, that has drastically declined to the point that young people um, uh, are, are looking more like the older people in terms of time spent with friends. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's um, a, a bit shocking, but in a way consistent with, with this other data. Let me interrupt and say this. I love the interaction between you and me, but also those who have joined us today. We had about 300 people sign up for today's Zoom. This topic clearly resonates. People are suffering or they want the information for maybe a loved one. So let's table for now the specificity about young people. But if it's something that anyone here wants to talk about, we are going to have the ability to have Q&A. So let's table that for now, but let's go a little bit broader and let's kind of zoom back just a little bit before we go any further. I've divided my questions into basically three buckets. And the first I want to have Dr. Ruth talk about and have Dr. Vivek Murthy talk about too, and of course you, is really about individual agency. What is our power to make a difference as opposed to the governmental role or community role? When we go through our day, you mentioned how we spend our time 
how do we adjust our priorities in a way that can be more attentive to this growing sense of isolation? So what I want to do first is play a clip from my interview with Dr. Ruth in her apartment just a few days ago about this very topic, about what people, each individual can do. Loneliness has to be combated. Loneliness doesn't go away by itself, by magic. Loneliness has to be combated like, a, like in a battle. I love what you're saying about the individual's uh, agency, that there's an opportunity for a person to make a change in their own life, that they have power. Do you think it's up to the individual to make themselves feel better? Yes, it's up to each person. You cannot just sit back and say, uh, by magic, I'll, be, I'll feel better. You have to make the first step to make sure that you are combating the loneliness. You are like being a soldier combating the loneliness. Now, something I remember you sharing with me is that when you were a young mother, you would have people over for parties because you couldn't take your daughter Miriam out very easily. I, you were raising her on your own. You were a single mother, but I, you wanted to be social. You wanted to have friends. And so is there ever an excuse really to not go outside or invite people in and to invest no, in these connections? No excuse whatsoever. Because when I was alone with Miriam, Every weekend, I invited friends, and we had parties and danced in the apartment while Miriam was sleeping in the bedroom. Do you feel that you are a good friend to others? I'm, not only do I think that I'm a good friend, I'm a superb friend. <laughs> I'm, I'm like the best friend that anybody could have. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I would love, uh, if I can call you Julianne, uh, what your take is on that, about individual agency. Dr. Ruth says it's a battle and that we can win. So one of the things that I loved is it's not that she didn't face barriers and we all face barriers, right? And so um, I, I, you know, I assume that her barrier was that she had a small child and perhaps, you know, getting a babysitter or, or not having, um, you know, being able to to leave the child to to go out and do that. She found a workaround, right? And and I think that that's one of the key elements here is that we all face barriers, but it's recognizing them and finding a way a workaround right <laughs> and and finding a way to get beyond that so that we can still uh um uh connect and it's worth the effort and and i think too often we fall into this trap of thinking it's too much work or it's too much effort but um, it's worth the effort and we can get into all the reasons why it's worth it yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's absolutely worth it Sometimes it feels rather daunting. And let me now play this clip from the U.S. Surgeon General about his approach and how to make something that feels daunting less so. So play Dr. Morthy's clip, please. I have found that it's small steps that get us to the big change. And sometimes we think, oh, well, if we're lonely, we've got to make some major change. Like, uh, I don't know, like to put aside five hours a week, you know, to, to hang out with friends or radically change my life. But I find that if we one start with the recognition that small space make a big difference, that can make it feel less intimidating. And then second is to think about what some of those small steps might be that we can take. So now I want to pass the baton to you, Julianne, what is your favorite small step? We're all here uh, hoping that you can guide us given all of your work with the social connection and health 
Lab with the U.S. Foundation for Social Connection. So we are listening. What's a small step that maybe we can all put into use as soon as we're off today's call? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the the easiest and simplest things you can do is to just simply reach out and and um, whether that's a phone call, a text, or um, if you're uh, around someone in person, is let just uh, a, a small gesture to to let people know that you were thinking about about them. I often will uh, find ways to to connect. You know, whether it's um, sharing a, a you know something I saw that reminded me of of a friend or or whatnot. Um, but these are are just little things that, of course. Uh, people can do and and you know as as a scientist i'm going to bring the science into this as well um so that it you know people don't just think oh that's just your opinion <laughs> um but we we do have evidence that for instance things like um expressing gratitude to others you know we hear a lot about maybe gratitude journaling but actually expressing that gratitude to others hey you know what i really appreciated that about you or um, you know, if I haven't told you when you reached out to me at that point in in my life, that meant a lot to me. It could be the littlest thing of of gratitude, but that helps those expressions of gratitude, of course, are going to elicit positive kinds of responses in return. Um, really uh, creating a, a positive spiral in, in, in interactions and, and increases that social bonding. Um, I also uh, did a really fun study where we had people do small acts of kindness for their neighbors, and it was literally just things like saying hello or um, waving or um, maybe offering to take in their their trash bins or, you know, it could be doing a favor for them, it, it, anything that they felt comfortable doing. And when people did these small acts of kindness over the course of four weeks, we showed significant um, decreases in loneliness and increases in connection. And so these small little gestures, uh, you know, as Dr. Murthy was saying, we do have evidence that they do make a difference. And, and I think uh, we often think of the, the bigger, grander kinds of either gestures or programs that we might need to do, but each of these things start to build over time. And oftentimes, even just the consistency of of reaching out to someone conveys that that they're cared about and it, it maintains this connection so that in your time of need you you still have this line where they um they're more likely to to reach out to you in return and so this builds this this social connection over time uh that that can strengthen these bonds I love what you're saying because it sounds um, so different than maybe the way many of us have been raised, right? We're supposed to be independent. We're supposed to be self-sufficient to rely on our own wherewithal to get through the day. But if we don't show need, then it feels like we don't have needs and then people won't show up for us or even ask how we're doing. So it's almost like that vulnerability invites connection. And I want to just, this is a good segue, if you don't mind, to the second bucket of questions that I have for you and what I asked um, the Surgeon General about and what I asked Dr. Ruth about when I went to her apartment just a few days ago, which is we have talked already about the individual and now I want to broaden it out to community, right? To kind of go back even a little bit further. And here I want to refer to some of your pivotal work. And you have argued, and I'm just going to read my notes so I don't misunder, you know, mis misspeak, that society actually benefits when individuals feel more connected. You have said there's impact on public health, community safety, economic prosperity, and the functioning of a representative government, and that having the sense of connection is especially important in times of local national crisis. And then here's a quote, the ability to mobilize resources 
via one's social connections can be a matter of survival. As extreme weather patterns become more frequent, connected communities will be crucial to weathering these environmental crises. So now we're talking about the individual, but let's move a little forward and take a broader view. It feels like our community and our country is impacted when the Surgeon General has proclaimed this as an epidemic. You're talking about that too in your work, of course. Explain that on a much larger scale. Yeah, so not only do we need this individually for our health and our well-being, but the more connected our communities are, the better functioning they are. And uh, it, it, we have to work together on, on, on many issues. And we're starting to see as we become more and more isolated, it's more and more difficult to tackle these big issues together because we often have difficulty um, seeing each other's perspectives because we're not interacting with people who perhaps have different differing kinds of perspectives, backgrounds, and beliefs and than, than our own. And yet we have common issues that we face that, that need um, solutions. And so we're seeing a lot of this in, in our political divides. But as, as we talked about also, even just uh, these, these kinds of uh, nat natural hazards or, or disasters. And it's so interesting because there's some studies that have shown that in, in these crises like um, earthquakes, fires, um, floods, that oftentimes it is your neighbors who are the first responders who get there before train, you know, any kind of trained personnel. And so in, in cases where people knew and trusted their neighbors, uh, that, that, that that often um, meant a matter of, of life and death. And, you know, it was interesting because not too long ago, my own community, we had some flash flooding and I happened to be out of town at the time, but it was so heartening to see my phone just like blow up with texts from friends and neighbors saying, are you okay? Is your house okay? And it was interesting because there's this group text and suddenly my friend, you know, that lives down the street says, you know, I'm okay, but I know my other neighbor's not okay. And so then people who didn't even know that person were jumping in to offer uh, whatever, you know, shop vac or, or whatnot. And someone said, I don't have any tools, but I'll make them dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I want to, I want to, I want to, to that. see if people come together. <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. I wanted to ask, of course, Dr. Ruth and Dr. Morthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, the same type of question about this long, you know, this kind of longer lens perspective. And so I asked Dr. Ruth about individual responsibility versus our collective community uh, needs and response. And here's what Dr. Ruth had to say. I'm curious what you feel is the personal responsibility of someone who feels lonely. Is it the government's job to make you feel less lonely? Is it the individual's job? Mm -hmm. Where is the power to okay. feel more connected? Good question. And it's all of the above. It's really everybody else, everybody's responsibility to say, if I have a neighbor who is lonely, I have a responsibility to find out what can I do to help that neighbor. Before I ask you um, to respond to Dr. Ruth's comment, I do want to play the Surgeon General's response. And here, he is going to echo another small step that he feels we should bring to the table. And you're going to hear some familiar themes, which I feel is really heartening about what it means to help a neighbor. But really, if you're helping a neighbor, there could be a selfish reason 
for doing so. So let's hear the Surgeon General. The other small step I might recommend is just to <clears throat> just to think a little bit about uh, the fact that serving other people, helping other people turns out to be one of the most powerful things we can do to forge connection. And this is especially important because you might sometimes we might think, gosh, if we're lonely, if we move to a new city and we're lonely or if we start a new job or go to a new school or just in general feeling lonely, then shouldn't other people be approaching us to help us? But it turns out that when we help other people, we actually help forge really strong bonds and reaffirm like our own faith and confidence in ourselves, our, our faith that we have value to bring to the world. And that's really important because when we feel lonely, sometimes we can start to actually feel worse and worse about ourselves and feel like we don't have much to offer others or the world. Wow. I love the notion that giving actually boosts our self-confidence, which helps eradicate feelings of isolation. So it feels like there's a win-win happening here. And I would love to know from your perspective, uh, since you are a PhD, since you are a psychologist, what is the science behind that? Yeah, that is consistent with a large body of evidence that shows that um, providing support to others is just as if not more beneficial than actually receiving support <laughs> and it, it's it might be kind of surprising but uh, uh, it's also consistent with the the study that i mentioned earlier that we did where we asked people to do small acts of kindness for for their neighbors now remember um we had them do the small acts of kindness right we were measuring the person's loneliness who was providing the act of kindness, not the person who is receiving it. Presumably, hopefully they benefited as well. But it, it's interesting that um, what this suggests is that one of the best ways to help ourselves is by helping others. This can provide a sense of, of meaning and purpose, feeling like we, you know, that, that we can be relied upon. Um, it's also really interesting because as I think a few, um, you and and uh, and uh, Dr. Murthy and and I think um, Dr. Ruth also mentioned, uh, is that sometimes it can be hard to reach out for help, right? And that because we have this ideal of um, independence and self reliance, that it can be really difficult to ask for help. Uh, but it takes away some of that vulnerability by reaching out and helping someone else. And interestingly, by doing that, um, not only are we connecting with others, um, but that, that helps us in return. And, and so it's, it's really, I think, incredibly powerful for all of those, those reasons. I would love to dive a little bit into some turns of phrase that I have found to be especially enlightening in this kind of conversation, and maybe you can add to them. Okay. So in the grief space, uh, I write a lot about grief and loss. What's considered unhelpful is to say, yeah, how's it going? Or like just something kind of vague, where if you ask someone who's grieving, how are you doing today? it's perhaps a more meaningful question as opposed to it feeling like a question you're just kind of, you know, checking off the list. I've heard another turn of phrase that I find really helpful. If you're at a cocktail party or a conference or just at a bar, wherever you are, and instead of asking people what they do, which might just be a one word response, what you do for a living, perhaps asking, what do you do that makes you happy? Or what do you do that brings you joy? Or what hobby are you enjoying lately? Something that's more requiring of that individual to provide context and depth. Are there prompts like that that you think can help spark more meaningful connections with people? Yeah, um, I think part of that is that it really gets to going beyond what 
the could be a a non answer, right? I think about how if if I ask my my teenage boys how how was school today, you know, the kind of answer I get is fine, <laughs> right? And you you get kind of um, you don't get much of a, a response, but really what we want to do is is ask the kinds of questions that get people thinking and that show that you care and understand their life, right? And even if you're just starting to get to know someone, you could ask things like, you know, what what excites you, what, what excites you right now, or what are you passionate about right now? Um, and because that takes it beyond the, you know, what do you do, <laughs> but what what excites them about what they're doing, or what excites them about their, uh, you know, some project they're working on, or or whatever. Uh, they may be, may be going on in their life right now. I love that because so often, let's say you've lost your job and you've been unemployed for a long time. We know that's a source of major isolation for a lot of people to lose that identity that's related to work. And if you don't share perhaps with someone that you have been struggling to find a new job, you're precluding that being a point of connection with somebody else who might be in the same position, but you would never know because you haven't chosen uh, to reveal that of yourself. So it just, it requires a different level of being willing to go there in the sense of building more uh, meaningful bonds, more meaningful relationships. Now, let me go into our third bucket of okay. questions. And then, of course, I am going to leave time for everyone to ask you. Uh, the doctor is in. <laughs> so we could definitely take advantage of you being here, which I'm so grateful for. But the third um, bucket that I wanted to talk to you about is that medically, we haven't really dug into this yet, our physical health that loneliness can actually be a killer. And unlike other problems or other diseases or other medical conditions or other awful considerations, this one is curable. Tell me about the medical consequences of feeling cut off, of feeling that you are not connected, that you don't belong. Yeah, I think first it, it may be helpful for um, many in, in, in who are here today who may recognize this as important to their emotional well-being um, or perhaps their mental health, but perhaps not really fully recognize how, how it can impact our, our physical health and ultimately our, our longevity. Um, and it really fundamentally comes down to the fact that humans are social beings and that humans um, have needed to rely on others for survival throughout human history. And uh, so our, our brains and our biology have adapted to expect proximity. And when we are alone or when we are not with trusted others, uh, we need to be, our brains need to be more active to be vigilant to threats in our environment um, and or or just to meet the demands of everyday life on our own and and so this can relate uh translate into dysregulation of um bod various bodily systems which if um experienced chronically can put us at increased risk for um disease and ultimately earlier death so uh one of the things and and some of my research that i'm most well known for are my meta-analyses on mortality and so in one of these, we had data from over 3.4 million people worldwide. And what we found was that when followed over, over years, often decades, that initially pe healthy people followed over time, those who were less socially connected uh, died earlier. So um, those who were lonely um, had an increased risk of earlier death by 26% and those who are isolated um, by 29%. And uh, this is consistent with uh, additional kinds of, of research that has been done that has looked at this. And I, and I do wanna point out, this is death from all causes. Um, and in fact, we actually excluded 
cases where uh, it, deaths were due to suicide, not because we uh, thought that that was unimportant, but rather we were worried that people might assume that these deaths were driven entirely by suicide. And so um, in the majority of cases, um, this was disease related uh, uh, causes of death. So we have very robust evidence of, of um, the, the long term impacts that that this can have on on our biology and ultimately our health and 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 lifespan. What I'd like to do before I play those related clips from Dr. Ruth Westheimer and Dr. Vivek Murthy is remind people how they can find out more about your work. Uh, Dr. Holt Lundstad, um, you can find her on Twitter X at J Holt Lundstad. You can find her on Instagram at julianne.holtlundstad.phd. Uh, you can also find her at the Social Connection and Health Lab at Brigham Young. You can find her work at the U.S. Foundation for Social Connection and the Global Initiative on Loneliness and Connection, where you are the founding scientific chair, uh, a board member. Uh, your credentials, we are so fortunate to have you in our company today. Honestly, like I'm pitching myself. So thank you again. Um, I do want to start this section, these clips of Dr. Uh, Murthy. I asked him specifically about um, our feeling of physical and mental health when it comes to the bereaved. Um, many times I've worked in this space for years, someone who is grieving feel like they need to be approached, that they are the ones that are bereft. And so come help me. I am here and they sit passively waiting for their friends to know, to acknowledge, to show up. And when they don't, feelings of um, resentment can pop up, which can complicate grief. Uh, they could feel more isolated because their friends or their family or even their closest loved ones are not showing up in the way that they would prefer. And so I wanna play the clip where the Surgeon General talks about what the griever needs to do. When you're in experiencing grief yourself, it's important <clears throat> to sometimes nudge yourself a little bit forward to be in other people's lives, to reach, call a, a good friend and tell them how you're feeling and to, to spend time, you know, like, or even if it's a few, uh, a little bit of time dropping by a friend's dinner party or going to see uh, someone at their retirement party, these small moments of human contact, they make a difference. Sometimes we, have to, sometimes we have to nudge ourselves forward in that direction when we're going through deep grief. What do you think of that? That's hard. When you're in grief, you really do feel like perhaps people should just know to show up for you. And of course, the downside of that is perhaps feeling more isolated when you're disappointed. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I can relate to it because like you, I lost both of my parents um, at, uh, um, very close to one another within 17 days of each other. <laughs> um, well, now I feel even more connected to you. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's uh, I can understand on, on a personal level where it can be hard, but uh, in part the, recognizing that people are there who want to help. And I think sometimes we're so afraid of being a burden on other people. I also experienced this when um, my husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer. He is in remission, so, um, and, and doing well. Um, but, you know, again, I didn't want to be a burden to people. And it was interesting because one of my dear friends told me, and, and I'll never forget this, she was saying so many people love and care about you and your family. Let us help. Like this, we feel helpless too. We want to know how, you know, please let us. And, and I realized that and now I've been on the other side of things where I've seen friends and family suffering um, in, in various ways and, and that I want to help, I truly want to help. 
And so in sometimes we need to just let people <laughs> and that can be hard, but, but we need to, because that can also help them. Right. And it can help forge these bonds again uh, so that people can feel close to, to each other. When, when you're going through hard things, you, you've probably also been on the other side of things where someone you really love and care about, you can tell they're suffering and they're shutting you out and you feel so helpless. Um, and so really letting people in um, can help you and help them. And, and, but in some cases, it may be letting people know you're struggling because sometimes people don't know and, and being open and honest and, and getting over kind of your, your personal uh, barriers to, to let people in, in that way as well. So we know that grief is just one reason why some might feel lonely or isolated or other. There are many other reasons that people might feel disconnected. Maybe it's a disability. Maybe it's something with how they look. Maybe it's the community where they live and they don't feel they're being made to feel that they don't belong. Um, so I do want to talk, and this is perhaps the most personal I got with Dr. Ruth. Um, so I want to share this clip. And on the other side, I invite you all to think about your questions. We would love to hear from you. Uh, Andy, if it's okay, uh, we'll go through the chat and find the questions that feel the most applicable to the most people. So in this uh, final Dr. Ruth clip, which is um, very powerful to me uh, and ends on a funny note, uh, I would love to hear from you on the other side. So let's play the Dr. Ruth uh, Westheimer clip. Thank you. One thing that you shared with me that I don't think is very easy sometimes for you to talk about is how you felt other because of your height, that it was something that made you feel different. You had talked about it made you feel unattractive, ugly. You didn't know if you would find a romantic partner. Right, and I and you, found plenty. And you found plenty. <laughs> and I married a few times. You married a few times. <laughs> and so when people feel other and they feel that they don't fit in, what do you say, Dr. Ruth, about that? I think that that's a stupid feeling and that you are wasting your good time. I go home and do something about it rather than just complain. You don't like complaining. I don't like complaining. You hate complaining. Yes. <laughs> you want people to decide that not being lonely is a priority. Right. Get to work. Get to work right now. <laughs> right after this talk, get to work. I would love your response uh, to the amazing Dr. Ruth. The one <laughs> and only, the one and only Dr. Ruth. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I love her spark. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it is easy to get caught up in self-pity and and uh and feeling in and turning inward right and i think that that's why uh helping others is so powerful because it forces you to look outward and rather than focusing so solely on you know inward and and on what's going on in inside you and, and dwelling and ruminating and, and really spiraling into a very negative place. And so that that stepping out of that and focusing on others can be a way to start recognizing, A, you're not alone because other people are struggling too. <laughs> Uh, and and sometimes it can help put your own problems, um, you know, maybe not, they may not seem as, as uh, severe or may seem like they are more um, uh, approachable, that, that we, we can overcome some of these. And, and I, I, that's not to dismiss any, 
incredible challenges that people face. And, and so I don't want that to um, dismiss any kind of empathy for the many kinds of circumstances that are so challenging and often outside an individual's control. You know, when you talk about othering, um, there are very systemic kinds of forces that um, can can feel over um, overwhelming. And so I don't want to discount that. Uh, but the that within whatever we are facing, feeling empowered, that we can do things not only for ourselves, but by by doing and, and looking outward, that we can be part of the solution and changing our, our communities and a light for our communities and building that connection within our communities that can start to make some of those changes. And oftentimes it takes individuals to do that. Thank you. I am so grateful for that um, perspective. And at this point, what I would love to do is invite Andy to go through the chat, make sure that if you have a question, uh, it's in there so Andy can look at it. And Andy, pick those questions that you think will help the most people here and when they watch the recording in the future. I would say the last one that just came in is the most, um, I think, general and helpful for a lot of us about, I think about taking action. How can, it's from Stacy. how can we most effectively increase awareness, understanding and motivation to create change around the topic of social connection in our own families and communities? People wanna be soldiers in your army. How can they do it? Um, well, you know, it's it's interesting because part of that was um, about awareness. And, you know, we talked about some of the health effects. And I recently uh, collected some nationally representative data uh, that asked people their perceptions of what what's, what's important for their health. And we saw the usual kinds of things at, at, um, at the top of the list, including things like exercise and not smoking and and other things but sadly uh social connection was at the bottom of the list and so despite the greater awareness that we um experienced around the time of the pandemic it still seems to be focused on emotional well-being and so we are still lacking um as a as a general um the general u.s public uh, lacking awareness of how just how important this is also for our physical health. And so one way to think about it is also, uh, you know, we have to, if we were to take our, our relationships just as seriously as we take other lifestyle factors for our health, um, we have to make time in our busy schedules to exercise. Um, even if it's not convenient, and even if it's, sometimes it's painful. <laughs> um, but similarly, we need to make time and prioritize our relationships. And I think that's one of the number one things is just recognizing just how important it is. And, and I think that, uh, especially on the heels of the pandemic, after we have had to cope with being isolated for so long, we've gotten kind of comfortable <laughs> um, being able to stay at home because we have a lot of conveniences and you know we can many of us can work from home we can get our entertainment from home we can shop from home and it makes it really easy for us to not engage socially and so we really do need to make an effort and and so i think that you know number one step is recognizing just how important it is and prioritizing it in your daily life. Uh, so not just, yeah, I, I value that, but putting it into action. <laughs> I, I love what you're saying. And I'll just say just really, really briefly before Andy, you ask maybe one more question in the time that we have remaining is that instead of I work, I'm a writer. So what do I do all day? I'm on my laptop, I'm writing, I'm alone. And I used to then go to the gym 
alone and plug in my AirPods and, you know, listen to music. But now instead I make a date with my friend and we go on side-by-side -side treadmills or side-by-side -side ellipticals so I can talk and catch up with her, which is such a treat. And it's just a nice thing to do. Uh, Andy, a really quick extra question. And, um, and then I got one more thing to say before we wrap it up. There's a question about uh, people who have social anxiety. It may not be so easy for someone to get out there and put themselves out there. Um, uh, someone might have experienced a major trauma about what happened to them within larger groups and can't be with a group of other folks. Um, how can we support folks who have social anxiety um, and people who may feel unsafe going out there you know, in, in the world? Yeah, I, I I think that that's an important question, and and in there are times when this has whether it's social anxiety or depression or other kinds of factors that go along with being isolated and and lonely that um, and especially if you found yourself um, stuck stuck in that that loneliness or stuck in that isolation and having a real hard time getting out of that yourself. Um, it, don't be afraid to not only reach out for help with your, your, your network, whether that's friends or family, but oftentimes um, that might mean getting professional help, um, seeing a counselor, uh, and, and working with someone who can help you uh, um, come up with uh, skills that that can uh, help you feel more comfortable or work through a prior trauma, whatever it might be that that um, may be the the barrier to to getting out there uh, that really is important to to get get that that assistance. That's so important. I have nothing to add. That is like the final word. It is so helpful. I do want to make sure, uh, because I didn't do it yet, that if you want information directly from the Surgeon General, he is on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, Surgeon underscore General on Twitter, uh, u.s.surgeongeneral on Instagram, and he's also on Facebook. You know, he is the nation's doctor. Pay attention to what all of these experts have to say. Follow Dr. Julian Holt Lundstad, you know, on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you follow Dr. Ruth on Twitter. Ask Dr. Ruth. Uh, these are the experts in the field on loneliness today. There are such a wonderful and growing rich uh, depth of literature that's being developed. It's ready for your, um, for your reading. And Andy, to reimagine, thank you for elevating the topic of loneliness and making sure we can talk about it and explore it. And I feel really lucky that we have three more uh, parts of our series to go. And in April, Dr. Ruth will have a wonderful announcement about what she is doing as New York's loneliness ambassador to continue and expand the conversation. Over to you, Andy, real quick to close us out. I just want to make sure everyone registers for the next three sessions we're having. I'm going to put that in the chat. Um, so join us next month. Um, Allison, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Holt Lunset, thank you so much for being with us today. And we hope to see you next month. Take good care, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.